Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me. I'm Jerry DeMarco, Canada's Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Je vais commencer par vous donner un aperçu des cinq rapports qui seront remis au Parlement cet après-midi. Ensuite, je pourrai répondre à vos questions. I'm going to turn now to our first report, which provides the findings of our audit of the Emissions Reduction Fund for the oil and gas sector. This fund was part of the measures that the Government of Canada rolled out in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As the name points out, Natural Resources Canada's Emissions Reduction Fund was intended to reduce harmful emissions while maintaining employment and encouraging investments in oil and gas companies. It is important that programs aimed at oil and gas companies be efficient and effective at delivering emissions reductions. Otherwise, they risk undermining Canada's efforts to fight climate change. Nous avons constaté que le programme avait été mal conçu car il n'établissait pas de lien entre le financement reçu et la réduction d'émissions nettes provenant d'exploitations classiques de pétrole et de gaz côtières et infracôtières. Par exemple, pour les deux tiers des 40 projets financés par le Fonds de réduction des émissions, les sociétés ont indiqué dans leur demande que le financement leur permettrait d'accroître leur niveau de production. Alors, lorsque la production augmente, les émissions découlant de cette production augmentent aussi. To help Canada achieve its national targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, Natural Resources Canada should systematically ensure that any policy program or measure it develops with the aim of reducing emissions is based on reliable estimates of expected reductions. This would mitigate the risk of undermining Canada's efforts to achieve its 2030 and 2050 targets for reduced emissions levels. Moving on now to our next audit, we examined whether Environment and Climate Change Canada and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada were working together using a risk-based approach to reduce algal blooms caused by excess nutrient pollution in three Canadian water basins, namely Lake Erie, Lake Winnipeg, and Willistook St. John River. Excess nutrients and algal blooms have been concerns in all three of these water basins and may worsen as a result of agricultural pressures and climate change. Canada has a stated goal of increasing agricultural production, which could increase nutrient runoff. Excess nutrients can lead to runaway growth of algae, which can in turn produce toxins that are harmful to humans, livestock, pets, and wildlife. Nous avons constaté qu'Environnement et Changement Climatique Canada et Agriculture et Agroalimentaire Canada étaient sur la bonne voie. Toutefois, Le ministère pourrait avoir un plus grand impact sur la qualité de l'eau douce s'il coordonnait mieux leurs activités scientifiques et leur échange d'informations avec d'autres organisations chargées de la gestion des ressources en eau. Environnement et Changement climatique Canada et Agriculture et Agroalimentaire Canada ont des rôles importants à jouer afin d'équilibrer les intérêts économiques et environnementaux. La coordination entre les deux ministères est donc primordiale pour faire face aux problèmes liés à la qualité de l'eau. Pour le prochain rapport, comme à chaque année, nous avons évalué le progrès de certaines organisations fédérales dans la mise en œuvre de leur stratégie de développement durable en nous attardant sur la transparence et la qualité des rapports d'avancement. Plus particulièrement, nous avons sélectionné 12 ministères et organismes et examiné leurs mesures ministérielles liées à trois objectifs de la stratégie fédérale de développement durable, à savoir côtes et océans sains, lacs et cours d'eau vierge et alimentation durable. Overall, reporting on actions to achieve the federal goals was poor. For the majority of these actions, federal departments and agencies did not follow guidance on reporting and important information was missing. Consequently, they did not report results for almost half their actions. The reporting that departments and agencies provide on their actions to achieve the goals set out in the Federal Sustainable Development Strategy should demonstrate transparency and accountability. Gaps in reporting make it difficult for parliamentarians and Canadians to understand progress being made against Canada's sustainable development commitments. Ce dépôt comprend aussi le rapport annuel sur les pétitions en matière d'environnement, 
Le Bureau du vérificateur général du Canada, dont je fais partie, sert de pont entre la population canadienne et les organisations gouvernementales pour les préoccupations liées à l'environnement et au développement durable. Au cours de la dernière année, nous avons reçu 14 pétitions qui soulevaient des questions dans divers domaines, notamment sur la biodiversité, les changements climatiques et les substances toxiques. This year's report also highlights recent actions taken by the government on issues raised in two previous petitions, one on aquaculture in the West Coast and one on a proposed recreational trail in Alberta's Jasper National Park. Je me tourne maintenant vers notre dernier rapport, qui en fait n'est pas une audite, mais plutôt un sommaire des leçons tirées des actions du Canada depuis 1990 pour lutter contre les changements climatiques. Après plus de 30 ans, les émissions de gaz à effet de serre, qui ont des effets dommageables sur le climat, sont en hausse au Canada. En dépit des engagements répétés du gouvernement visant à réduire les émissions au pays, celles-ci ont augmenté de plus de 20 depuis 1990. Canada was once a leader in the fight against climate change. However, after a series of missed opportunities, it has become the worst performer of all G7 nations since the landmark Paris Agreement on climate change was adopted in 2015. There has been some recent momentum in the form of legislation and stronger plans, so I'm still optimistic that Canada's performance can be turned around. But we can't continue to go from failure to failure. We need action and results, not just more targets and plans. Au cœur du rapport se trouvent huit leçons tirées de l'action et de l'inaction climatique du Canada. La première leçon à tirer est qu'un leadership et une coordination plus efficaces sont nécessaires pour faire progresser les engagements envers la lutte contre le changement climatique. D'autres leçons portent sur le besoin de réduire la dépendance du pays au secteur qui rejette de grandes quantités d'émissions, de s'adapter aux effets du changement climatique, d'accroître la sensibilisation du public, d'investir dans un avenir résilient face au changement climatique, d'agir pour donner suite aux cibles climatiques et non seulement d'en parler, de faire participer toutes les parties prenantes à l'action climatique et de protéger les intérêts des générations futures. La pandémie de COVID-19 nous a montré qu'en temps de crise, les mesures fermes et concertées du gouvernement peuvent avoir une incidence positive. Une crise climatique à long terme nous menace plus que jamais. Les changements climatiques, comme les pandémies, constituent une crise mondiale, une crise sur laquelle les experts tirent la sonnette d'alarme depuis des décennies. Les deux posent des risques pour la santé humaine et dans les deux cas, l'ensemble de la société doit intervenir pour protéger les générations actuelles et futures. In closing, there is a need for the federal government to achieve real outcomes on environmental protection and sustainable development, not just words on paper or unfulfilled promises. All too often, Canada's environmental commitments are not met with the actions needed to protect air, land, water and wildlife now and for future generations. And that is a trend we urgently need to reverse. Ce message est tellement important que je tiens à le répéter en français. Le Canada a déjà été un chef de file dans la lutte contre le changement climatique. Toutefois, après une série d'occasions ratées, il est désormais le pays avec la pire performance de toutes les nations du G7 depuis l'adoption de l'historique Accord de Paris sur le changement climatique en 2015. Nous ne pouvons pas continuer d'aller d'échec en échec. Nous devons prendre des mesures et obtenir des résultats. Trop souvent, les engagements du Canada en matière d'environnement ne sont pas accompagnés des mesures nécessaires pour protéger l'air, les terres, les eaux et la faune pour les générations actuelles et futures. Cette tendance, il est urgent de l'inverser. Thank you. I am now ready to take your questions. Bon, nous allons passer aux questions. Uh, just a reminder of our, the rules of this, our national press theater for now. So it's one question, one follow-up. Nous avons à peu près 50 minutes devant nous et nous allons commencer par la salle. Christian Noël, Radio-Canada. 
Bonjour, Monsieur le Commissaire. En, en lisant le rapport, on a l'impression que ce que vous êtes en train de dire, corrigez-moi si je me trompe, c'est qu'on a un gouvernement environnementaliste en parole, mais pas nécessairement en action. J'aimerais avoir votre réflexion là-dessus. Oui. Alors, c'est 30 ans euh, de cibles, d'objectifs, de, de plans, mais pas de résultats. Ça, c'est la leçon qu'on a tirée de, de cette histoire du, euh, du Canada en, en matière de changement climatique. Ce n'est pas une, une, une grande épopée de plus brillants exploits, c'est des de, 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 de échecs et des chèques. Et ça, ça, euh, ça, je suis déçu de ça, mais je, je regarde à l'avenir et, et on, on a du temps pour, pour, euh, pour, euh, pour faire des progrès, pour améliorer les résultats au Canada. Somebody, somebody's asking you to answer that. Well, well, that one of the rules in the National Press Theater is that you get to ask your questions in your language, and there's no asking for repeats. You can use your time whenever you get it. Mais, mais je, suis sûr, je suis sûr que vous allez répondre en anglais quand ce sera le temps de mes collègues de poser la question. Um, vous parlez d'actions ratées en 30 ans. Euh, vous dites que le temps presse. Les conditions météo extrêmes causent ce qu'on voit présentement dans l'est du pays autant que dans l'ouest du pays. Le risque, si on continue d'agir à ce rythme lent-là maintenant, quel est le risque actuel? C'est un risque pour la planète, c'est un risque pour tous les Canadi Canadi Canadiens et Canadiennes. Et on n'a pas l'option maintenant de, de faire rien et ça va être, ça va être tout, 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 euh, tout, tout euh, d'accord avec ça parce que l'inaction, ça va, ça va euh, être lié à des changements plus graves. Alors, on voit même cette, cette semaine, comme vous avez dit, il y a des problèmes à Colombie-Britannique, des problèmes à Nouvelle-Écosse, à Cap-Breton, à Terre-Neuve aussi. Juste dans une semaine, on a, on a trois régions qui souffrent. Alors, on a besoin de, de, de concentrer de ce moment au futur à atteindre les objectifs. Pas seulement des plans, pas seulement des mots, mais des résultats. Dylan Robertson, Winnipeg Free Press. Uh, hi there. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Basin programs. Uh, these regional scientific committees for the two departments, they were formed in 2018. They had maybe one meeting and that was it. Uh, I'm wondering what you think drives that, the fact that they stopped having these meetings, and what does that say about how well these two departments are collaborating? Yeah, so the, the Water Basin's report uh, looked at interdepartmental cooperation between Environment Canada and Agriculture and Agri-Food Agri Canada. And the, uh, you know, we, it was, it was a, a result that was, you know, it wasn't all, it wasn't all um, bad news, like on the climate report in the sense of uh, results. But the, 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 there needs to be an increased level of cooperation with a focus on the actual outcomes in the water. So, for example, in Lake Erie, where, where I, uh, near where I grew up, The problem of excess nutrients, or eutrophication as we call it, has been there since I was a kid. And, and it's not very much different than in the 1970s. So the cooperation is good. And it's, there's not, a, there's not uh, a situation where there's, a, there's no cooperation. But the cooperation has to be directed towards positive outcomes in terms of water quality. Otherwise, we can continue going from decade to decade and having meetings, having, having uh, you know, scientific conferences, having risk management uh, tools in place. But if the water quality isn't getting any better, then you know, that's, that's what really matters. Right. And uh, also on the Basin Program, you mentioned the Agriculture Department's instruction to boost output. Uh, that can intensify the nutrient runoff. Uh, it, it means like the, the department doesn't really address that in their responses to you, though. I noticed, and I'm wondering what that says about how well they're actually balancing those objectives. Yeah, it's a difficult question because the the nutrient loadings, for example, in Lake Erie in Ontario, on the Ontario side, have not really diminished significantly over the last 10 years. So even though there's this level of cooperation, the results in terms of the actual effluent that's going into the water, they're, they're not there, and that's why the, the problem persists. The problem will get worse because of either one of two things or both. One is there's, there's a push towards greater agricultural production. And if that 
is the same level of runoff as with historical um, historical production, then that's a big problem. And the secondly is that these algal brooms are exacerbated by water temperature and climate change is warming our waters. So even if we left the nutrient levels the same year to year, over time, the problem would likely get worse simply because the water temperature is going up and the conditions for algal blooms would be increasing. So it's a, it's a difficult question. It requires cooperation, not only between the two departments we talk about in this report, but with the provincial, municipal, indigenous communities, the United States at the federal level and at the state level. These, are, these three basins are shared across international boundaries. Global News, Abigail Biman. Uh, looking at the flaws that you found in report four concerning the onshore program, I'm wondering uh, how much you think that the overestimation and other issues will impact our overall emission reductions targets. When we set out on this audit, I was hoping to get a firm number as to what level of reduction was coming out of the emissions reduction fund, because it is called an emissions reduction fund. But we were very surprised and I was very disappointed to see that Natural Resources Canada isn't doing the necessary tracking to estimate net emissions. So their, the program was taking a, a narrow or myopic view of the problem at hand without looking at what other factors were, were affecting emissions from, from the projects and the facilities that were funded. And they also weren't looking at whether this fund was adding value to what was happening already through regulation, the methane regulations that have come into force uh, last year and then and further, further provisions next year, they weren't separating out, okay, what added value is this fund providing? Are there any actual net emission reductions? For some of these applicants, they actually said, we're gonna increase production. So what, what happens if you cap a valve here or you, you stop flaring at this site, but overall you're increasing production? that would have a negative impact on ach achieving our climate change targets. So it is a problem and, and we can't have funds that are, that, are, that are not rigorous in their estimations of the reductions or in achieving the results of, of net reductions. Th this was a, I know it was made during COVID-19, it, it was a hastily put together program, but that's still no excuse. Luckily, most of the funds are still in the kitty and they could improve the program before it's too late. I'm wondering where you go from here. I noted that this was the only report where the department only partially agreed with your findings and there was some pushback and then your office pushed back again. So how, how does that get resolved? Yeah, that was unusual that we had to put in a, a, a point counterpoint at, after one of the recommendation responses. The responses to this particular report on emissions reduction fund were quite disappointing. They didn't indicate to me that the department was willing to fully acknowledge the degree of problems. In fact, some of their responses were, were, were seeming, seeming to get at uh, questioning our, our findings, which, which obviously were, were their ironclad findings and they're, they're, not, uh, they're not something that, uh, that should be questioned in their response to a recommendation. But, you know, I'm quite disappointed with the, with the responses. It doesn't bode well for the remaining, there's still hundreds of millions left in this fund. And if those responses are gonna guide for further action on this particular fund, then there might be further problems going down the road with the third round of funding. David Thurston, CBC. Hi, thank you, Commissioner, for, for doing this and for your reports and the work that your staff did. I wanna stick with that report about the emissions reduction fund. I, your report mentions this, but I wonder if you can say it in your own words. Does this fund amount essentially to a fossil fuel subsidy, something that the government and past governments have committed to phasing out? So the emissions reduction fund, at least for the non-repayable portion of the fund, and the aspect of free financing, interest-free financing, those are fossil fuel subsidies. This government has recently committed to eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. There used to be the focus on, oh, we're only going to eliminate inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, but luckily the current language of the, of the new government is to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. The reason that that's important is because fossil fuel subsidies run counter to the stated goal of the government, which is to transition to a low carbon economy. So the, if, if you tie this question to the lessons learned on climate change report, there has to be a coherent policy 
uh, uh, network of policies amongst the government to achieve a common goal. When you have different departments pushing in different directions, you get problems like this emission, the emissions level going up, even though you have individual programs that are trying to make them go down. So this, this particular emissions reduction fund, it isn't showing the results that it should, given the name of emissions reduction fund. So, I mean, just to put it in plain and simple language, it sounds like you're disappointed with that. Are you? And I'm just wondering if you would also comment about the state of the political divide when it comes to politics, when it comes to climate change in, your, in this country. Your Lessons Learned report kind of touched on that, that it's become such a politicized issue. So permit me two questions here. Are you disappointed that this is essentially, portions of this fund is essentially a fossil fuel su subsidy? And just if you could comment about how politicized climate change has become. Yes, I can confirm that I am disappointed with both the design and the implementation of the Emissions Reduction Fund. And on your second question, regarding lessons learned from Canada's record on climate change, we recommend that all levels of government seek to depolarize the debate towards a common goal in, in, in the, uh, with the objective of, of saving humanity and nature from, from disastrous levels of climate change and, uh, and warming and severe weather and all of the things that we've heard about uh, this week in Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and British Columbia. So the, one of the, uh, this is tied to another lesson learned, which is the eighth one, which, which is the necess necessity for a longer term view. And this is a really difficult issue for governments to deal with because they necessarily, I shouldn't say necessarily, they frequently discount the future and focus on short-term objectives and gains. Climate change is an intergenerational issue and we need to put in structures that are commensurate with the time span of climate change or biodiversity extinctions, for, uh, uh, biodiversity loss, for example. Our current structures are not have current have not up to de, up to this present time have not met the task of dealing with long term environmental and social issues like climate change. Olivier Ferrand Boissy, TVA. Merci. Euh, ben, je pense ma première question, j'aimerais juste vous entendre en, en, en français euh, là-dessus sur la, la dépolarisation nécessaire là, de la question. Sur la dépolarisation. Mm -hmm. Oui. Alors c'est 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 très important. Euh, les, les, les politiques du gouvernement seront, euh, euh, ça serait plus probable qu'elles seront mises en œuvre si, si le débat est dépolarisé. Alors, on a besoin d'améliorer de, de, de la situation, d'aller de, de, euh, vers euh, la coopération au lieu de, 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 de débat. C'est mieux aujourd'hui qu'il y a quelques années. Alors, là, il y a plus de, plus de coopération euh, en ce qui concerne, par exemple, le, le prix sur le, le carbone. Euh, et alors, ce n'est pas, pas tout négatif, mais euh, le futur dépend sur la coopération. Nos gouvernements sont là pour protéger le, le, la société de, de, contre le, le, le changement climatique. Alors, c'est essentiel de dépolariser le débat et de concentrer sur la coopération vers un but d'améliorer de, de, de euh, nos résultats en ce qui concerne le changement climatique. On voit souvent les, les gouvernements, il y a eu, dans les 15 dernières années, deux gouvernements principalement là, au pouvoir, on les voit souvent se renvoyer la balle. Euh, vous parlez beaucoup d'engagement, mais pas vraiment de résultats. Est-ce que euh, vous avez constaté, dans les six dernières années, quand il y a eu un changement de gouvernement, euh, une évolution dans les résultats où c'est encore seulement des engagements puis on ne remarque rien en termes de réduction. Est-ce qu'il y a une, une différence en, en vrai dans, dans, la, dans, dans, dans les résultats concrets de réduction des émissions à travers les derniers gouvernements? Alors, euh, toutes les mesures n'ont pas de résultats qui sont instants. Alors, j'avoue euh, qu'on que ne peut pas dire... Au, Aujourd'hui, on a une nouvelle mesure, on va voir des émissions réduire demain. Ce <rire> n'est pas le cas. Mais après 30 ans de l'histoire de, 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 du Canada en changement climatique, beaucoup de plans, neuf plans, quatre euh, euh, accords internationaux, 
et beaucoup d'objectifs, un nouveau objectif euh, cette année euh, en ce qui concerne euh, la réduction de 40 à 45 des émissions. Euh, de, de, des émissions. Alors, oui, euh, euh, ce n'est pas, pas un cas qu'il y a une, une lacune de, de, de plans, de cibles, d'objectifs. Le problème est le résultat. On va passer aux uh, journalistes au téléphone and we'll come back to the, to the room here if we still have time after reporters on the phone. Alors, opérateur, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Merci. If you have a question and you're using a speakerphone, please lift your hands up before making your selection. If you have a question, please press star one on the device's keypad. Si vous désirez poser une question, veuillez s'il vous plaît appuyer sur les touches étoile 1 de votre appareil. The first question is from Marika Walsh from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, I just wanted to be clear on the looking forward. We have seen very clear plans from the Liberals, or they say they're very clear in achieving the 36%. Do you, have you seen the implementation so far that is required in the time frame that they have to achieve at least the 36% cut by 2030. Is that at least happening, or do you also not yet see that happening? So we haven't audited whether their 36% projection will add up and reach, um, reach that level by 2030. That has become somewhat moot because there's already a new target of 40 to 45%. So we are going to see under the Net Zero Act that passed in June a new plan, either this December or at the latest in March if they give themselves an extension. So we are not going to analyze the current plan as to whether it's going to add up to 36% because it'll be superseded by a new plan with, that's up to date for the new, uh, the new target of 40 to 45% reductions by 2030. Having said that, If, if past performance is the best indicator of future performance, then story is not good. We've had several plans, nine plans, over the last 31 years, right, from 1990 to now. And none of them have achieved their objectives. Even though they add up at the time, they say that they're going to meet those objectives. When you then go forward 10 years and see, okay, how did you do? Usually by then, the debate is about the next plan, and there's talk about the next plan, and, oh, don't worry about our past results, the next one will be better. Well, look what's happened, right? Our new target is down here towards the bottom of the page. Our emissions are up here. We need to have more than just plans. We need to have results. And... When, you're, when you highlight in the report that Canada, since 2015, has the worst performance of any G7 country. Is there something that you see that the government could have done to not be in that position? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, the government likes to say or tends to say that essentially the last five years was about them actually putting in place policies. You can't change the economy on a dime, all those kinds of things. But you are specifically pointing out that Canada is the worst performer. So was, something diff was there something different that could have been done Or was everything that could have been done, done? No, not everything that could have been done was done. Canada was relatively late uh, at the federal level in taking a leadership position on carbon pricing. So you see the European countries and the G7 that have a downward trajectory since Paris of 4% to 10% in terms of the emissions reductions. And, and you know, the European car, uh, cap and trade system is important in that. That's a different form of carbon pricing than a, than a carbon levy, but it's the same idea. Canada's carbon levy was, it's a good thing, and, and, and it's, it's important that it's there, and it's important that the, the price gets closer to reflecting the true value or the true effects that, um, that emissions have on the environment. But Canada was pretty late in, at the federal level, taking a strong leadership role in truly combating climate change and using its full constitutional jurisdiction to do so. So that explains partly why it's, it's, uh, we're here in, in uh, 2021 with emissions that are higher than in 1990 when Canada first committed to stabilizing its emissions. Prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Merci. 
The next question is from Rafi Budjikanian from CBC News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, hi, Commissioner. I'm wondering if you can reflect a bit further on the whole depolarization issue, keeping in mind that there are, as you point out yourself in your report, some parts of this country that are far more dependent on fossil fuels for their economy than others, such as Alberta or Saskatchewan. How do we all sort of get along to, to bring them on board to achieve our climate change goals? The, uh, the, int- the, the divergent regional interests and the different economic bases for, for their econ- economy, is, it's a critical issue. That's why for next year, as noted in our report, we'll be looking at the notion of a just transition. So you can't simply state, oh, we need to move towards a green economy or a low carbon emission economy without seeing how, com- how affected communities and affected individuals and workers and so on would be would be um, would be dealt with in, in that sort of situation. So I think part of the polarization is the fact that those who would be most adversely affected, say resource-based communities and workers in, uh, in the jurisdictions you just mentioned, if they aren't assured that there is a plan to transition them to a more sustainable economy, then you can see why there's a polarization, right? Because they're, they're worried if they're going to be left hanging to, hang, hung out to dry. So that's why... Any plan for reduced emissions has to be accompanied by, and this is a core core tenet of sustainable development, accompanied by a legitimate plan to transition not just the economy to that, but the, the communities and the individuals most affected. So I think those regional divisions, they, their interests do coalesce in the long term. Nobody wants to live in a further compromised planet. Nobody wants to be experiencing the severe um, weather disasters that we've been experiencing in Canada at an accelerated rate lately, those will only get worse if we don't come together. So that's why I say that the, the, the interests coalesce in the long term. The answers re, uh, to reducing emissions in the short term include a just transition for the people most affected in resource-intensive, carbon-intensive uh, industries, such as in the regions you just mentioned. Okay, and if I may, as a follow-up, sort of similarly to what Marika was asking you, are we anywhere close to reaching net zero by 2050? Is that a realistic goal at this point? Oh, it's a realistic goal. We're not close to achieving it yet this year, but uh, and we've made it harder on ourselves because when we first started getting serious about climate change in 1990, our emissions are now 20, 21% higher than when we started working on getting the graph to have a downward slope rather than an upward slope. But there is time to reach net zero. I, I don't advocate waiting until you know New Year's Eve in 2049 20, 20, uh, to, uh, to, to get working on that. There should be a steady, steady progress from here to there. And in fact, the, the sooner we start working on it, the, the, uh, the more beneficial impact there is on the atmosphere because of how long carbon dioxide and methane last in the atmosphere. So the, the actual slope of the graph matters. But no, there's no reason to give up on, on net zero in 2050. In fact, if we give up on net zero in 2050, we're going to reach 2050 and have a worse scenario in terms of a compromised climate, mass uh, migrations of people uh, displaced by by climate change if we're getting into the two or three degree uh, global warming uh, area. So the you know the the do nothing alternative is actually worse than the 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 tough work that will be needed to actually reach net zero. Both both options are difficult. One leads to a disaster that we all want to avoid, which is you know a, a continued warming climate. Reaching a net zero economy will involve some difficult decisions and some and some tough transitions, but it's better than it's better than just giving up and and uh, and leaving our children with with a, a planet that is compromised and and uh, and and that if that's our legacy, then 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 we failed. Operator, prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, merci. Next question is from Mia Radson from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, 
Hi, yes. I'm wondering, you mentioned in the report that the natural resources did not design the program to make sure that all of the emissions that are reductions that are coming are actually new. Um, I'm just wish, wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. If we have any sense of how many emissions that they say will come are actually new emissions that wouldn't have been done before. Yeah, it's a great question. I thought we were going to answer that by doing this audit, but uh, we were surprised that Natural Resources Canada was not able to give us a global picture of the uh, net emissions reductions. So, for example, if an applicant said in their application, we're going to reduce um, these fugitive leaks of methane, for example, and by the way, we're going to increase production, Natural Resources Canada only, only tracked the, the one side of the ledger, not the not the uh, the net emissions reductions. It is even possible that for some of these projects, the net effect was emissions production rather than reduction. So that's I mean that's that's a poorly designed program. As I said earlier in response to a question, I'm disappointed by the responses to our recommendations. This is this is not a, a gray area. This is this is a, a program that is in need of vast improvement. Most of the money is still in the fund, so it's not too late to actually uh, avoid a good money after bad scenario. But I'm afraid if the if the responses are indicative of what they're actually going to do, then, then there will be good money after bad in this fund. It, so what you're looking at here then is a fund for almost $700 million that was supposed to retain jobs and cut emissions. And it has, you're saying, no actual requirement to retain jobs and no sign that it's actually going to cut emissions. What we're getting at is, you know, were they tracking actual performance indicators linked to their objectives of reducing emissions, which is the title of the fund, retaining jobs, increasing investment? We were surprised to see a, a lack of rigor in the, with respect to the department in tracking its objectives. It's, it's sort of basic, the basics of performance management is you set objectives and you track your progress towards that. You can't just say, oh, we're going to ignore net emissions and we're going to ignore double counting from the effect of, of the methane regulations. We just want to look at this narrow little aspect of the, of the fund. That's why the numbers are not reliable. Their emissions, their emissions uh, estimates are vast overestimates. Uh, opérateur? Emission, emission reduction estimates, sorry, I sorry. should say. <laughs> opérateur, la prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Merci. Next question from Raphaël Pirot, Agence QMI. Please go ahead. The line is open. À vous la parole. Oui, bonjour. Euh, je voulais euh, vous entendre peut-être un petit peu plus précisément sur euh, le pipeline Trans Mountain. Euh, quel est votre diagnostic donc par rapport euh, à l'action du gouvernement en lien avec euh, cette euh, avec le rachat? Est-ce que vous pouvez répéter le, le niveau de, de, de euh, audio, audio était trop bas oh. pour le, cette fois? Mais oui, pardon. Je... Oh. Oh. Est-ce que vous oui. m'entendez? Oui. Oui. Euh, C'est ça. Non, je voulais vous entendre sur le pipeline Trans Mountain. Euh, comment est-ce que vous est quel est votre diagnostic par rapport à ça? Et si vous aviez des recommandations à faire euh, pour le gouvernement euh, sur cette question. Alors, avec, avec euh, le projet d'agrandissement du réseau de Trans Mountain, le TMX, nous, nous constatons que c'est un exemple de l'incohérence de politique. Alors, le, le, acheter et, et gérer un pipeline, euh, euh, c'est contre l'objectif du gouvernement de, de, de euh, baisser le niveau de, des émissions. Alors, moi, je, je, je constate que le, le financement de ce projet, c'est un exemple de l'incohérence des de mesures du, du, euh, du fédéral. D'accord. Et je me, je me demandais si... Euh justement cette, euh, cette décision-là, donc vous, vous dites que c'est de l'incohérence. À partir de maintenant, je ne sais pas si vous êtes en position de, de donner une recommandation, mais qu qu'est-ce qu que vous pourriez dire maintenant que c'est fait, ces choses du passé, comment est-ce que le gouvernement pourrait agir euh, dans ce dossier-là? Quelle est la bonne attitude à adopter? 
Alors, euh, nos, nos euh, leçons tirées de la performance du Canada en, sur le dossier de changement climatique, nous n'avons pas de recommandations, c'est seulement une, une sommaire de, de leçons tirées et, et des questions que les parlementaires peuvent poser euh, dans le nouveau Parlement. Qu'est-ce qu'ils vont faire avec, euh, avec TMX? C'est une question que vous pouvez poser à, à, au, euh, au ministre. Opérateur? Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Palak Nangat from Parliament Today. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, Commissioner. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, I just wanted to stick with the, the NRCAN Emissions Reductions Fund. Um, I, I hear you saying that it, uh, it's not too late to sort of uh, course correct, I guess, and, um, and try to finick and make this uh, or try to, I guess, beef up the measures of progress within the department. But I'm curious for you, given that you're talking about your disappointment with the department's response to the recommendations, um, Should, would you advocate for this program or this initiative to be scrapped, or is there some coming back from this kind of program? Um, and I only ask because I, I, did, uh, I did note that you called it a fossil fuel fund. So I didn't get the last part of that. You only did this because... Oh, I said, that, uh, I said I did note that you called it a fossil fuel subsidy. Sorry, not a fund, a fossil fuel subsidy. You're right. Yeah, so... Um, The, there is an opportunity to course correct on the emissions reduction fund. Most of the money is still in the fund, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, despite the, the poor responses to our recommendations, obviously the, the department can try to do better. And perhaps uh, you can pose that question to the department uh, and, and ask whether, whether they will course correct, as you put it, in, uh, in going forward on the emissions reduction fund. The, the, the working environment for this fund has changed since it was launched. The price of uh, the, the commodity prices that, you know, one of the reasons for this fund was the depressed market for oil and gas, obviously, during, during the earlier stages of COVID. That's definitely not the case anymore. So there is an opportunity for the department to look at, to, to, to have a so sober second look at this fund and determine whether going forward they should just extrapolate what they did in round one, which is a bad idea, um, according to our, our findings. It's hard for me to know what, what, uh, what changes they will make. Based on their responses, I'm not optimistic, but there's still the possibility that they, that they will see the wisdom of, of uh, course correcting on this fund. Okay, thank you. You answered my second question. Oh. Alors, opérateur, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Natasha Belowski from Canada National Observer. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, Commissioner. Thank you so much for answering our questions today. Um, I was hoping you could talk a bit more just about the Emissions Reduction Fund and, you know, how do the findings of the report reflect on the government's pledge to phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies? Because from what I can tell, it, it is, it, you, know, you know, it's looking like that is what this amounts to in a nutshell. So does this mean that there, it's worth it trying to pivot? I know you were mentioning that earlier, but based on the current findings, would it make more sense to discontinue it? So the emissions reduction fund, at least the part of it that's non-repayable, which are effectively grants, although they call them non-repayable loans, but I think that's code for grant, um, and the fact that they do they uh, carry the interest on the on the on the loan portion, those aspects are fossil fuel subsidies, no doubt about it. And as I mentioned earlier, this government has committed to accelerating its elimination of fossil fuel subsidies in Canada because they realize that that's necessary to achieve what we've called policy coherence with its objectives of reducing emissions. So the, um, the, there is, yes, as I've said to, in response to the other question, there is the, um, the change in circumstances of the commodity prices, of course, have changed vastly since when this was launched, but there's also the stronger commitment towards an accelerated elimination of fossil fuel subsidies. That's another factor that merits uh, a second look at 
at, uh, at whether they should continue with the fund as it has currently been implemented, which, as I've said, does not track net emissions. And the report found that Natural Resources Canada didn't ensure the projects it funded provided value for money. And I'm hoping you can speak briefly about what this means, both in terms of the quality of the projects it was accepting, but also, you know, the implications for taxpayers. So despite it being called an emissions reduction fund, it had other objectives. So we were, we were focused on the emissions side because we were interested as to how well it would contribute to Canada's climate goals. The department emphasized with us, look, there's, there's job retention objective, there's the investment objective. Look at it in a, in a more holistic way. So we asked for the data on, well, how much value for money are you getting? What is the dollar cost per job saved, for example? They can't show us that either. So it's really difficult to say what the value for money is when we know the money, we know, we know the de denominator, but we don't know the value. We don't know the numerator because they aren't tracking that. And that, that goes contrary to the basics of, of, of performance management in government. They have to be able to say to taxpayers, you know, that we've gathered this six or seven hundred million dollars from the tax base of Canada. We're redistributing it to the fossil fuel industry. Here's the value you're going to get out of that. And I don't just mean assertions that there will be emissions reductions or job retention or investments. There needs to be data to back that up. And it can't be the data that they've collected, which just looks at a narrow aspect of emissions without taking into account the effect of the methane re uh, regulations and the effect of increased production at the facilities that indicated in their applications that they would be in increasing production. Operator. Thank you. Merci. Once again, please press star one on the device's keypad if you have a question. De nouveau. Cette étoile 1 sur votre appareil si vous avez des questions. Next question from John Woodside, Canadian National Observer. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to follow up on uh, this, this policy incoherence uh, side because the, the report does uh, reference both the, the onshore program, uh, the Emissions Reduction Fund, and the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion as, as examples of this policy incoherence. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I'd just like to hear some some reflection on this. Like, well, like, um, like, what does this say about the, uh, how seriously the government is is uh, treating, you know, its its climate action here? Uh, because, and also just to take kind of a step back and maybe kind of put a little little extra context on this. I mean, these these seem like policies that are like like Trans Mountain, for example. The government has said this is we're going to use the revenue for clean energy investments. Uh, they have an emissions reduction fund that is actually a fossil fuel subsidy. I mean, this this sounds like a scandal. This sounds like a government that is uh, saying it is doing climate action, but uh, but then is just moving public money towards you know the fossil fuel sector. Um, could you kind of reflect on this this incoherence and whether you think it amounts to uh, amounts to like a shell game like this? The, uh, the lesson learned around policy coherence, which, you know, is a fancy way of saying, you know, everyone working towards a common goal and being on the same page, is linked to the last lesson learned about long-term planning and intergenerational equity. A common denominator between both the TMX uh, expansion and the Emissions Reduction Fund is that they were hastily produced uh, decisions. And it's not unusual for governments to focus on short-term expediency at the expense of long-term uh, gains. And this is a, th these are examples of that. You know, they have, the government sets out states to the international community in, in binding uh, treaties like the UN Convention on Climate Change that it's going to do its part to, to uh, prevent catastrophic climate change, but then short-term expediency can essentially trump that. And what ends up happening is you have a net effect of increased emissions because countless short-term expedient decisions add up in a way that undermine the long-term goal. If you think of it in another analogy, 
if if Canada sets out a, a goal of uh, of uh, preventing climate, doing its part to prevent climate change, and the the analogy is trying to push a large rock up the hill, to do that, it's a very difficult problem to do. You can't then dispatch one department to then you know be responsible for doing pushing up the hill. And then later, dispatch other departments to be pushing on the other side of the rock, pushing it back down. That's essentially what's happening with policy and coherence. The long-term goal is being undermined by short-term decisions that, that not only don't further the objective, they run counter to the, the objective. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and as a follow-up, uh, there is a, there's an opportunity, I guess, that's, that's suggested here that says... Um, centralizing responsibility within the federal government uh, could potentially help with these leadership challenges. And, and you give an example of uh, France having its council of ministers and basically being the, the center of uh, basically centralizing it rather than it being kind of a individual responsibilities across departments. Can you speak to this a little bit more? Like, like what is, what is Canada doing right now versus what you think it, it should be doing? Like what, what does that look like? Well, picking up on the analogy I just used for your last question, centralizing decision-making would, would help avoid having two departments pushing on the opposite side of that boulder that we're trying to push up the hill in terms of preventing catastrophic climate change. So that's, that's one of the benefits of it. The centralization isn't the answer to everything. Obviously, there are different types of expertise in different departments, but... It's it is one mechanism, and uh, and we point that out in the in the uh, report. I should add, though, that this uh, this report isn't saying that the federal government should displace all other efforts by other other levels of government, uh, municipal governments, uh, indigenous communities, and so on. It's it's a whole of society problem. Canada needs to take a leadership role and do its part. But it also depends on the actions of all the other actors in this field that also have an ability to contribute to the global effort to at least reduce the scale of climate change in the years forward. Operator, est-ce qu'il reste encore des questions au téléphone? Il en reste une. Elle est de Vian Lum, de Politico. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thank you for taking our questions. Um, on the lessons learned report, lesson number one identifies stronger leadership and coordination. And we saw some high level change towards more coordination with the former environment minister becoming the natural resources minister. But besides, you know, making the Environment Canada a central agency and getting PCO and Finance Canada more involved, what additional opportunities can departments take now to expedite progress on climate action? Well, they have a great opportunity right now because the new net zero legislation is compelling them to come up with a new plan to match their new target. So they, they could, you know, focus on leadership like in lesson one, but they could also focus on the, on the lesson about actually achieving targets and not just making them. We, we need these plans. They guide action. But more importantly, we need plans that are accompanied by results and Canada's history has been has been uh, has been a history of of failure, uh, followed by failure, followed by failure, and that can't continue because if that continues, we just get worse climate change. It's not like we we can just say, well, it was too hard to do, and therefore we're going to be able to to um, to to maintain the status quo. The status quo results in much more severe catastrophes like that we've been seeing in in Canada this just this week. Thank you. And for my follow-up, uh, I wanted to follow up on your data point earlier. I was wondering if you could speak to the current state of Canada's information infrastructure that measures emissions. So this is kind of a wish list question for you. What national databases or tools would you like to see developed to help you and Canadians find reliable emissions data? So, for example, maybe, I don't know, it's a standardized formula or methodology to measure scope three emissions. Yeah, so th this uh, this report doesn't look at the accuracy of emissions, uh, total emissions for Canada. It certainly, the other report looks at the accuracy of the estimates for the emissions reduction for one particular program. It's a good question regarding um, the quality of the of the data. Um, there are there are certainly 
um, lessons to be learned on the fact that we were underestimating um, fugitive methane emissions, methane being a very potent greenhouse gas uh, over the years. So there's always room for improvement, but we don't get into this particular report doesn't focus on that question. It's an important one that we will consider for our future audits, though. Pour finir l'heure, je crois Christian Noël de retour dans la salle. Bonjour, euh, merci de prendre une dernière question avec nous. Euh, C'est clair que l'économie du Canada, son PIB, dépend encore à 8 comme vous le dites dans le rapport, ou presque, de ces secteurs polluants. La transition va être essentielle. Avec quelle rapidité vous croyez que cette transition-là doit arriver pour être capable d'atteindre les cibles qu'on a, qu a, qu a fait pour la carboneutralité? Alors, le, la transition a, a besoin de commencer maintenant. Elle a déjà commencé avec, euh, euh, avec euh, le, le, le charbon. Alors, nous avons un, un programme pour éliminer le, le charbon au Canada et il y a un programme de, de transition juste pour ce secteur. Alors, ça, ça a déjà commencé. L'échelle du, du, du défi va être beaucoup plus grand avec les deux autres secteurs de pétrole et gaz, mais ça a déjà commencé. Ça se peut qu'on qu verra de, de, une nouvelle loi sur ce sujet euh, euh, dans, dans ce nouveau Parlement. On a, on a entendu euh, parler de ça, de euh, loi sur les le transitions justes. Euh, C'est aussi un concept qui est et, euh, qui est dedans l'accord de Paris. Alors, on, on a déjà euh, signalé en 2015 qu'on va travailler sur les le transitions justes. Ça a commencé avec, euh, avec euh, le, le charbon et ça va continuer avec les autres secteurs qui, euh, qui sont liés à, à des changements éco économiques euh, que nous avons parlé. Est-ce que ça va assez vite et est-ce que vous venez de donner euh, l'impulsion au gouvernement d'aller plus vite? Pardon? Est-ce que ça va assez vite et venez-vous de donner au gouvernement une impulsion pour aller plus vite? Alors, est-ce que ça va assez vite? C'est difficile à, 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 à répondre à ça parce que c'est déjà trop tard pour, pour beaucoup de choses. On a, on a un niveau de, de température qui est déjà 1,1 degré Celsius euh, euh, en, 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 en comparaison au niveau pré-industriel. Alors, c'est urgent, euh, ça c'est ce que j'ai dit dans, dans ma déclaration d'ouverture, c'est urgent de, de, de travailler sur les, la réduction des émissions, c'est urgent de travailler sur les transitions justes. C'est tout urgent maintenant parce que le Canada et le monde, ce n'est pas, pas seulement le Canada, n'a pas fait le travail qu'il avait besoin de faire depuis 1990 jusqu'au présent. Alors, si tout le monde est satisfait, je crois que ça va mettre fin à l'exercice.